And that's what climate change is about. It is literally, not figuratively, a clear and present danger. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. The ability of CO2 to do the heavy work of creating a climate catastrophe is almost nil at this point. The price of oil has been artificially elevated to the point of insanity. That's not how you power a modern industrial system. The ultimate goal of this renewable energy you know, plan is to reach the exact same point that we're at now. You know who's trying that? Germany. Seven straight days of no wind for Germany. Uh, their factories are shutting down. They really do act like weather didn't happen prior to like 1910. Today is Friday. Indeed, Friday, you irrelevant little climate munchkin. We are here for CCR 72, Climate Change Roundtable. The topic this week, heat waves, fires, and climate, oh my, with a hat tip to the Wizard of Oz. Because it seems like, you know, Toto, we're not in climate reality anymore when it comes to the media. So with us today are our usual suspects, plus a special guest. We have with us today Dr. Sterling Vermitt, uh, Linnea Lucan, and Steve Malloy of JunkScience.com, who's going to be talking a little bit later about the effects of wildfires and PM 2.5 smoke and other things. But first, I want to get to our crazy climate stories of the week. And boy, have we got some for you. First up, we have one from the New York Times. And this is uh, something that Steve brought to our attention. Get this. Hotter Europe poses a threat to older to adults. Extreme temperatures are the new COVID. <laughs> yes, you can, you can catch extreme temperatures at any time of the year. It's going to strike you down in your old age. What a headline. You know, put, well, on, you know, put on your mask and get your vax. I, I had initially first missed that. I had focused on the old woman there. Uh, and New York, New York Times is trying to make it sound like this uh, woman who lives in this air conditionless apartment in um, Rome is like sweating for the first time. And then <laughs> someone someone pointed out that phrase, that extreme temperatures are the new COVID. And I have to credit Jim Lakely, you know, Jim Lakely from Heartland. He he has it. Um, he, he, you know, he's got the right comment for this. Extreme temps are the new COVID. But if you are concerned about climate lockdowns to mirror COVID lockdowns, you're the conspiracy theorist. Well, here they say it. Right there, extreme temperatures are the new COVID. How can that possibly be too? It's crazy. Well, think about it. You know, Europe doesn't have a lot of air conditioning. And so, you know, for them, I remember the heat waves back in 2003, the big right. heat wave then. And they there was lots of people that died, uh, particularly older people, because, you know, they don't withstand the heat as well or don't have the funds to provide air conditioning or even fans. Here in 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 Reno, Nevada, where I live now, we have a program going on at the local TV station to provide fans for the elderly in the middle of the heat wave. It's being done in conjunction with many different groups uh, around the area, including the Knights of Columbus. And so we're, we're actively working on solving that problem. But the New York Times has this viewpoint, I guess, where air conditioning and fans don't exist. People can't mitigate these high temperatures. And that's the ridiculousness of it. You know, it's not something that you catch. It's not something that you can prevent from their viewpoint. It's just something that's going to happen and you're going to die from it. Well, it's not true. You can mitigate this stuff and people have successfully mitigated extreme temperatures for decades. And it's, it's not the crisis that they try to portray it as. Well, the well for other, millennia. Yeah. The other thing that's really misleading, uh, you know, the, the impression that's given and stated in many of the stories that are similar is that uh, these heat waves have become more common uh that they're killing more people that that extreme heat or uh suboptimal heat is uh killing more people than cold and the truth is it's whether it's in europe whether it's in the us uh whether it's in china study after study has shown cold kills more people than heat every year and the number of deaths attributable to suboptimal temperatures be the heat or cold are declining not getting worse. It's not a new pandemic. And in fact, the heat waves themselves are not increasing in frequency or severity. Now, if you take all those away, where do you get the COVID? And <laughs> it, it's, 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 it's one 
misleading statement or lie piled upon another to build oh, okay. a narrative. Sterling, are they kind of tipping their hand there with the COVID comparison then? Yeah, they are. They, you know, it's like, look, next they'll be telling us to wear uh, masks so our hot breath doesn't kill somebody. <laughs> uh, well, you know, you to, know. Ster to Sterling's point, you know, the, their own national climate assessment, the most recent complete one has been through peer review, has this graph showing this massive spike in heat wave index during the 1930s. And, you know, since then it's dramatically declined and it's burbling around now. But it's nothing like it was in the 1930s, but they never mention that. Even if you go to EPA's website, they, they seem to pretend that heat waves began in 1960. It's so dishonest. And we yeah. have data, but we have data going back that shows deaths related to both extreme weather events and suboptimal temperatures. Now, there are many fewer people back then, but still, as a percentage of the population and even in absolute numbers, more people died back in the 30s from temperatures uh, than die there today. But then and now, the truth is, more people die from cold than heat. Than heat. That's right. And NOAA has documented in their own webpage that um, during the 1936 July heat wave in the United States, the biggest in the United States ever, still has not been surpassed, 5,000 people died due to heat because they didn't have air conditioning or electric fans or whatever. So, you know, the thing is, is that heat waves happened well before climate change was even a glimmer in the eye of science, before people started driving SUVs and, and all these other things. And so the thing is today, we're, we're much more adaptable. We are able to be able to mitigate that just simply by the way we live and the technology that surrounds us. All right, let's go on to the next one. This one here is uh, from the, the Washington Post. Uh, this one's a, just, wow. Climate coach, <laughs> why Fahrenheit no longer measures up? That's right. We can't just give temperatures normally anymore. That's not scary enough. No, no, no. We need to have a different scale. We need to start reporting the temperature index. And that's the real measure of how much death and destruction is going to rain from the skies. And, you know... Uh, I, su the I suggest Farron super height as the uh, <laughs> new <laughs> term. <laughs> oh, you my know. goodness. Yeah, it just it, 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 it you, you know, Linnea pointed out earlier this week on a story she did talking about some nonsense printed on the Hill that, you know, every time I think I've seen the most insane argument, they come up with another one that's even worse. Right. Yeah. Right. Because we didn't have a heat index before this current heat wave. We never combined uh, uh, humidity uh, with temperature to come up with a heat index before this year. Uh, I just uh, um, look, I'm from Texas and we have heat, a lot of heat every summer when I was a child. Uh, well, a teen, let's be honest. When I was a teen, we had one summer where we had 50 six straight days of over 100 temperatures, uh, more than 60 straight days with no rain. Uh, that was the most severe I've ever lived through. But even then, um, it was pretty, it, they talk about dry heat, right? They talk about dry heat. Well, Dallas isn't Arizona and or Nevada, but still it's much drier here than Houston. And Houston, on any particular day, is likely a couple of degrees cooler than Dallas. But the humidity there is almost always 80, 90, 100 yeah. percent. It feels worse. Now, are you telling me? Week. Yeah. Are you telling me we didn't have a heat index that measured this stuff before this past week? Uh, yeah. How long does the saying, it's not the heat, it's the humidity. How long? Yeah. How far back does that go? <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, if that was the case, everyone in the subtropics and the tropics should be dead already, right? Because there it is go. way hotter there. Yeah. And they've well, been talking an awful lot about wet bulb lately. Which... In Florida, Louisiana, th th it would be depopulated. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the rotting corpses would be stinking the place up. Where, this was really... What country, what country has the largest population on Earth? It's India with 1.4 billion people. And I imagine their wet bulb temperature is pretty high. Yeah. No, wow. it's fair. And, it's fair and super height. 
uh, there year year round, Steve. Yeah, you know, maybe yeah, we should correct. start using the metric like the media likes to use when they try to compare the size and the magnitude of something to, you know, number of, of Manhattans or whales or whatever, you know. We can have the number of Houstons of, you know, uh, temperature index, right? Yeah. This is 16 Houstons of temperature nastiness yeah. out there. What's I interesting? Also, I had this guy in the Washington Post, the climate coach. You know, they hired him on to promote climate idiocy, yeah. and he does his his best at it. He tries to incorporate climate into every aspect of life. You know, from grilling hot dogs, uh, just <laughs> I mean, washing your clothes. I mean, to everything. It's it's really sad. The Washington Post gets grants now. They have this whole climate section and a whole climate staff. I mean, what newspaper has that? Um, not even the New York Times has that. Uh, the, but AP. Does. the AP does, though. Oh, because, right. Yeah, they were funded by five different foundations to cover right. climate. All right. Yeah. Let's go on to the next <laughs> totally unbelievable headline. This one is from CNN. And I got to tell you, this one, it not, doesn't take the cake this week, but it's pretty darn close. Get this. Underground climate change. I kid you not. Underground climate change is deforming the ground beneath buildings. Oh, Yes, it's jumping right out of the air and deforming the ground, right? Well, you know, when you read the story, you realize that they just came up with this name by some opinion of some guy. It's not real. It's not anything that's actual, actually physically connected with climate change. It's just another marketing buzz phrase they've come up with, you know. And so, Do you know, Anthony, you know what this is called? What? This is called geologists are trying to get climate funding for. <laughs> yes, there you for, go. Uh, and like architects are trying to get climate funding for foundation work right. stuff. That's what this yeah. is called. And I, and I gotta love the picture they used there. That is appears to be downtown Chicago, uh, and the river, you know. And so uh, from the headline is it doesn't look to me like any of this is underground. Maybe I'm puzzled. I, maybe they couldn't get anyone to dig down and find that picture of underground <laughs> climate change. Uh, well, know. look, as far as I know, you've got people living underground there and in sewers and things. <laughs> the Morlocks. You could, have, yeah, you, you, could have, you could have employed some homeless people to take pictures of the deformity from underground climate change. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. All right. And you think that one's bad. We've got the groaner of the week. Ah, oh, this one... This one is just, people need to be riled up. Meteorologist names U.S. heat waves after oil and gas giants. Yes, indeedy. The heat wave that's roiling through Texas right now is now the Chevron heat wave. Only one problem. He's going to run out of names of oil companies pretty soon. This is, this is from a guy that used to work for the Weather Channel, a meteorologist who should know better. But he's, he's drunk the Kool-Aid. Actually, I think he's drunk the spiked Kool-Aid because he's just off on a tear about, you know, how terrible climate change is. So he feels like he has to contribute something. And so now he personally has decided for the rest of us, for the whole planet, that we should name heat waves after oil companies. When, in fact, there is absolutely no connection. And the IPCC says this. There is no connection between long-term climate change and severe heat weather events or weather events in general. You know, weather happens on a on a scale of hours to days. Climate change happens on a period of 30 years. You'd think this guy would understand this. Anthony, I'm going to blame your entire profession, meteorologists, for this, uh, if, if this gets taken up as a standard response. At next time there's a heat wave and it's so, the Saudi Aramco heat wave or <laughs> Exxon, you know. Well, you, you know, I mean, the whole thing is just ludicrous is because, you know, we're, we're, you know, the, the relationship between heat waves and the use of fossil fuel products is completely inverse. And, and why, you know, why would you, um, I mean, just, it, you know, I understand why they do it, but it just makes no sense factually. It's me. Well, no, but they're not worried. You're, uh, you know, you, I know your mistake, Steve, <laughs> is that you think they're concerned about facts. I know. I, I keep forgetting. I keep they've forgetting. shown they've shown time and again. Facts no don't matter. Image is what's important. Yeah. Marketing is what's important because the goal is not science. The goal is pushing authoritarian policies. Mm -hmm. Right. It is indeed. And, and you know, that's what it's been all about. It used to be global warming and then it went to climate change. 
And then it went to climate disruption and climate uh, crisis, climate disaster. You know, it, they come but up it, with a new marketing phrase every couple of yeah. years when the old one, you know, loses steam. And, you know, if you go and look at Google Ngram and see the change in these phrases being used, you can see very clearly when these things are introduced, you know, and again, it's all marketing. And so what this guy's doing here is that heat waves are being marketed as, you know, a product of the oil and gas industry because, uh, you know, we've got to push them down. But what these folks don't seem to realize is that if, if, if you know, why these days if, if BP and Exxon and everybody else just says, you know what, we're getting pissed off about all this BS that you're spewing. We're shutting off the oil supply for, you know, a week. Look at the chaos that would ensue if they did such a thing. Of course, they, they would never no. do anything like that because they're not irresponsible like some of these idiots that glue themselves to the asphalt or deface paintings or things like that. But just imagine how the economy of the world would grind to a complete halt if let them, yeah, let them pull. A, let them pull an Atlas Shrugged. Let let them all become John Galt for a week and see <laughs> and see how civilization grinds to a halt. Right. And I mean, uh, I I don't know how many Wesley Mooches we can have in the world, but we've got a lot of them, and they seem to all coalesce at the WEF and the UN every year. But uh, just a few John Galts could destroy the whole narrative and edifice. Because when when the wind turbines aren't turning in West Texas, and I guarantee you during the summer on a hot day, that's typically when they're not, uh, and we have no natural gas to keep our grid on. Uh, of course, to be fair, Texas isn't the problem nationwide. Um, it, it, there would be revolts. Yeah. There, yeah. there would be revolts. People would say, hold it. Uh, so. So I agree with you, but you know the problem with the oil industry is that while you know they're responsible enough not to you know go Atlas shrugged on us, they're not responsible enough to push back against this lunacy um, a, 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 as it catches fire around the world. And uh, in fact, and and they even aid it. And, and so, I mean, on one hand, they're responsible by you know keeping their product going. On the other hand, they're re irresponsible by just letting the scare um, take off. But I'm not convinced that it, you know, look, I'd suffer, but I'm not convinced it would be irresponsible for them. They've got to work. They're corporations. They're supposed to make money for stockholders, not to worry about society, not to worry about the world, not to worry about wars. Produce a product, make a profit, keep yourself in business over the long term and return money to your, your owners. I'm not convinced it would be irresponsible for them to shut off the valves for a few days yeah. to teach the world how critical they are. Yeah, we'd have a whole new theme for the all, movie, The Day like, the Earth Stood the next Still. Time, the next time you bring up any more crap about climate change and taking us to court, every every city gets the valves that's suing them right now should have the valves shut off yeah. until those lawsuits are withdrawn. And, and just make it a warning. We can do this at any time. Well, yeah. you know, I think if they just pushed back a little bit, <laughs> it, it would make a big difference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're yeah. a kinder man than me, Steve. <laughs> well, there's Carr Ingham in our chat. Mm -hmm. Spoke to him just the other day about some of the stuff going on in Texas in the Permian. Um, it's uh, He knows better than anyone what kind of nonsense has been harassing them out there in the oil field. <laughs> um, yeah. The... Uh, the Honestly, thing I don't think the protesters really... like to go to the Permian Basin. I've been there in the middle of summer, and I can uh, tell no you one it's not a pleasant Midland. experience. <laughs> so you're telling me. <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd like to have left them on the asphalt, glued to it for <laughs> six or eight hours without denying them water and anything to cool them and see how long they last. And, and then when they pass out from heat, <laughs> exhaustion, go in there with acid and remove their hands from the, you know, and say, look, this is going to happen every time. I, I think you just have to take a stand. I think you have to say, no more of this nonsense. You're destroying civilization. You're killing people, and you're going to be the one that suffers from now on. Oh, don't sugarcoat it, Sterling. <laughs> I know. Well, the, I, I know. I'm a little soft too on this sweet issue. On them. Yeah. I'm a little soft on this issue. Uh, well, that's the on. On. They, they've made their choice. They should have to live with it, right? If they've yeah, that's right. themselves on the road. 
Um, one okay. of the problems, though, Sterling, is, you know, and they brought it up in that one uh, New York Times or maybe it was the Los Angeles Times article um, about how we might need to live with some blackouts to stop climate change. Oh, yeah. They do. They said they keep coming back to this in that article. They say we might have to live with blackouts, but no one thinks it's a good idea for us to live with blackouts because people die every time there's a blackout. Um, right. And then they keep coming back to it, though. They're like, but it's something we should consider. And it's like, right. How can you be so morally bankrupt? It's incredible. Yeah. But All right, let's move on. Let's move on. <laughs> OK, so we have a month ago. This was the big headline. Dangerous heat and heavy wildfire smoke marching across North America. And then we've got another one today that we've got out there. How climate change drives heat waves and wildfires. And then, you know, that they're, they're, they believe absolutely there's a link between this. Um, you know, again, heat waves are weather events. Climate is something that happens over 30 years. Climate change happens over 30 years. And then there's another article today from Greece about, you know, wildfires burn for a fifth day. And, um, you know, it's just unbelievable but we did a story um uh, sterling did a story last week about um check your facts yahoo news and new york times neither canadian wildfires nor heat waves are getting worse and the data is right there of course these journalists uh who engage in what i would describe as suboptimal reporting don't go out and look for this data they just simply don't. They just follow the narrative and boom, they go right after the narrative and make these headlines. But the bottom line is, is that if you look at the data and really the data tells the story and that tells the story truthfully, there isn't a crisis related to heat waves. You know, it's just not there. There's not a crisis connected to climate change. One of the other things that they're going after, you know, is gas stoves. And they're kind of equating this to the whole problem associated with smoke and wildfires, the whole issue of, you know, particulate matter pollution, something called PM 2.5. There's the claim that indoor gas stoves are making, you know, your interior of your home just as bad as living in wildfire smoke and other crazy kinds of claims, you know. And even going further than that, no, no, we got to not just limiting the home, you know, we're going after pizzas because the pizzerias are out there making particulate matter that goes off into the atmosphere of cities. And therefore, you know, that's a risk. You know, I, I just, the madness is just unbelievable. But, you know, imagine it. Can you imagine going through New York City and not smelling restaurants or pizzerias, you know, that's part of the culture. That's part of the experience. And yet they want to get rid of that. And then finally, Biden is trying to limit portable gas generators. You know, they can't just stop at stuff going on inside your house. They got to go after your gas generator because, you know, if we have to endure those blackouts that they think, hmm, might be a good idea, you know, but people die. No, no, no. You can't have a portable gas generator to keep your AC and your, on or your refrigerator from spoiling on the food because, you know, that would affect the climate. And then it, it's just, just absolute madness. Steve, you've been keeping up on this stuff here and you've been particularly um, relevant in the whole discussion of the whole particulate matter um, number, PM 2.5, that the EPA uses as a gauge for pollution. What are your thoughts on all of this stuff? Well, so I've been battling EPA on particulate matter for about 30 years now. And, um, you know, particulate matter, PM 2.5, uh, it, you know, the way to think of it is soot. And PM 2.5 is very fine soot. Uh, particles may be the uh, width of one twentieth of a human hair, very fine. And EPA's theory is that you know, when you inhale this fine soot, it uh, you know it, it quickly goes from your lungs into the rest of your body. And EPA over the last thirty years has has created PM two point five, which is just soot, into essentially the most toxic substance known to man. Um, EPA claims that any uh, inhalation of PM 2.5 can kill you within hours. I mean, there's 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 no substance that any exposure to will kill you. No, not, not the most toxic thing we know of ricin or botulinum or anything like that. But with PM 2.5, any exposure can kill you within hours. And they've taken this so far as to claim that 
one in seven deaths in the world today, about 8 million people a year um, die from, from breathing PM 2.5. And so I, I've been in court with EPA uh, about this. Um, you know, during the Trump administration, we had a lot of uh, success in knocking back what EPA considers to be its science showing that PM 2.5 kills. Um, there's, you know, there's basically, you know, we could talk about this for hours, but I'll try to keep it short and, and maybe take questions. Um, you know, th there's, there's no epidemiologic evidence. There's no, uh, EPA has done human clinical experiments. We've had a real life experience with deadly air pollution. None of them show that PM 2.5 kills anyone, has ever killed anyone. Uh, we just went through this, um, you know, uh, air apocalypse um, <laughs> in the Northeast uh, last month, uh, where New York, New York City skies turned orange. And per EPA science, uh, the death rate should have skyrocketed. But of course, it didn't. Um, EPA also claims that PM 2.5 uh, causes, exacerbates, triggers asthma. Of course, this is not true. I mean, asthma is an allergic condition. Uh, to have an asthma attack, you must be exposed to an allergen. PM 2.5 is just a, a carbon particle. There's, there's no yeah. allergen attached to it. Um, and, uh, you know, if you look at the New York City uh, asthma you know, emergency room mission data, there's really nothing remarkable there. Um, you know, slight, slight blip up but likely caused by all the panic, because remember the media was constantly scaring people with the orange air. Uh, there was also a, a slight blip up in April when there was no air apocalypse. So it, it, it's, not, it's not the smoky air that, that uh, it, you know, smoky air is not a health problem. It's ugly, might not be pleasant to breathe. Your body changes when it, uh, you, you change your breathing patterns when you encounter smoking air. You know, people, even athletes will say, well, it's harder to, train, you know, it's harder to run in smoky air. And that's because, um, you, you know, your body doesn't want to inhale deeply. Your body wants to in inhale shallowly when, when the air is dirty. And mm -hmm. when you're running, then you're trying to fight your body. So that's why it's so difficult. Um, you know, years ago, I worked on uh, when EPA was doing its uh, secondhand smoke risk assessment, and they were trying to show that secondhand smoke would cause cancer in, in dogs um, and, and, and other animals, uh, but they, you know, they could never get the dogs to inhale the smoke deep enough because <laughs> everyone. That sounds like animal abuse to me. Yeah, animals just they breathe shallow. Everyone does. They breathe shallowly when the air is dirty. You know, yeah. it, it seems to me we wouldn't we didn't don't didn't even need the New York experiment or the Washington D.C. or Baltimore experiment with all the smoke. Because the other thing they're targeting, as Anthony, you know, pointed out, as we've we've been talking about for months here, is is gas stoves, right? It would seem to me not a single person could be alive in a commercial kitchen, uh, in any of these fancy restaurants. You know, how does Gordon Ramsay live? Uh, how does Wolfgang Puck exist yeah. with all the PM two point five? They must be around with all these gas stoves. And what's funny is, while they claim. You know, while people like New York, uh, New York City government uh, claims we got to get rid of all the gas stoves, got to get rid of the gas furnaces. Um, now, the the pizza kitchens, it's a real weird anomaly. I, I don't know what's going on there. But when they passed their regulations and laws recently that would ban uh, new buildings from having gas stoves and that would start retrofitting older buildings, do you know what they exempted the largest source of natural gas burning in New York City. They 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 had these monitors up on buildings where they could see the the heat sources, the natural the, the the methane, the natural gas coming out. They were commercial kitchens. Mm -hmm. The five star restaurants were putting out all that <clears throat> gas, all that heat, and they were exempted in the law. Mm -hmm. So evidently, you don't care about workers and and fine diners because it's okay for them to die, uh, except <laughs> they're not, of course. That's well, the whole point. You know, if you want to conduct some home experiments with PM 2.5 without uh, killing yourself, you know, you, you can buy like an air cleaner that has a digital PM 2.5 readout. Now, I have one. I, I put it in my walk in closet. <laughs> and most of the time, you know, the reading is very low, about uh, five millionths of a gram per cubic meter of air. But when I go in and start doing things, you know, the dust starts flying. 
and the PM right. level shoots up to levels that EPA says, well, of course, EPA says any level will kill you. So even the, you know, uh, still air level in, in, uh, in my walk-in closet is, is deadly. Um, but, you know, you, you just see how silly this stuff is when you start measuring PM 2.5 for yourself and, and, um, and, and your own exposures. You know, I think a great funny. new business would be to uh, promote building PM 2.5 safe rooms for people. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's especially be, funny when you get airless. back to Midland they, or something. They would be airless and the people would die. They'd suffocate. Yeah. Linnea, yeah. well, go ahead. You were going to say something. Sorry. Yeah, I, I was going to say that it's especially funny when you look at places that have regular dust storms and stuff like Midland or, or you know, Egypt or something. Uh, where you have, you know, suspended dust in the air or any construction site where there's suspended dust in the air pretty much the entire time. And that's a lot more intense than any average person is going to experience. And this isn't like asbestos fibers or something. It's just regular naturally occurring carbon particles. But, um, no, I, Steve, there's an experiment that we, uh, have covered before both well, both you have a lot more than I have anyway um, at junk science and in some of your testimonies talking about how the EPA tries to come up with the idea that this stuff is really harmful. And we've talked about some of their experiments that they've done to try and prove that gas stoves are really harmful yeah. where they like, you know, tape off a room with a bunch of plastic sheeting and stuff to try and isolate it. And then they let something run. And then they say that this is what you're, getting exposed to right, on average right. when that's clearly, I mean, the science is so bad on that. You don't have to be a scientist to realize why that doesn't make any sense, but they've done a lot worse than that. Trying to prove that tailpipe emissions can hurt people. Oh, sure. At the uh, university of North Carolina in Chapel Hill and Harvard university and university of Rochester, maybe several other universities around the country, they've actually built gas chambers um, where they hook up the gas, gas you know, chamber, they'll, they'll get their human guinea pig, they'll put them in the gas chamber, and then they'll hook up a uh, an idling truck engine <laughs> to the gas chamber, and they'll 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 force these people to inhale um, particulate matter or ozone or whatever pollutant they're trying to test uh, at an extremely high level for two hours, and of course this is all patently illegal um, and, it, it, and it gets really comical because EPA is saying that well any exposure to particulate matter kills but if you look at the consent forms that the EPA makes the human guinea pig sign they don't say anything in there about well any exposure to particulate matter can kill you you know you may have a cough or two but that's about it I mean the whole thing is is just ridiculous um, I, you know I, I went I sued EPA over these human experiments that they were conducting with particulate matter. And so we were in court, EPA admits, well, the reason we do these things is because our epidemiology, which is the basis of EPA's claims that, you know, particulate matter kills everybody. Uh, our epidemiology doesn't really mean anything because after all, it's just correlations, just statistics, and that, you know, that's not really science. Um, so, so we're conducting these experiments to see, you know, if it's true that particulate matter kills people. Now you got to ask yourself, well, why are you conducting experiments to see if particulate matter kills people? That doesn't sound very ethical. It's illegal, in fact. Um, but I mean, the good news for EPA is that particulate matter is, in fact, harmless. And, and none of their subject, study subjects ever experienced so much as a cough or a wheeze. Now, one egregious example I'd like to bring up, because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's awful, um, EPA funded researchers at UCLA and USC in the early 2000s to blow, um, uh, you know, school bus diesel exhaust up the noses of children as as young as ten years old, and these are of course minority children in clinics oh. that are doing it for the money. Now, no one was hurt, but this is the kind of twisted stuff that the government is doing to try to advance its environmental agenda. It has the overtones of Nazi Germany and Mengele <laughs> and doing his experiments to try to advance medical science, so to speak, by doing torture test on prisoners and so forth. Right. I mean, it, it is just abhorrent, the stuff they're doing. They yep. talk about, I hear all the time about labs being shut down and investigated for uh, unethical human experiments, but the EPA somehow is exempt from this kind of, or EPA sanctioned studies are exempt from this kind of stuff. Not only is the stuff, not only are the participants not fully informed, 
mm -hmm. of what EPA says the risks are, right? They, they sign a form that doesn't inform them that the first particle could kill them. Um, but the fact that they're experimenting on children. Yeah. Uh, and it's and illegal. Problem, it's, il it's illegal. <laughs> and, and so this is crazy. But I've got a question for you, Steve, because I've always wondered this about the experiments. I don't know. I've, I've never asked you uh, personally. So you're hooking up a diesel engine to a room where these people, one or more, are sitting in breathing the exhaust. Why does carbon monoxide not become a problem? Because I do know that people can still kill themselves. Oh, it's sure. harder nowadays to kill yourself in a yeah. garage because cars are much cleaner, but they do it. So, yeah. so how does that not? Uh, well, they, you know, they, I mean, they process um, the air. So they take that, they take out the carbon monoxide ah. and basically just expose them to the diesel particulate. I so carbon monoxide is not a problem. Okay. <laughs> that would be especially good news. Well, and that's and that's, that's one of the, the things that they're yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the good yeah. the good thing is they're not monoxide poisoning people. Well, yeah, I can just see people going in. Hold it, won't this? Uh, you know, I, I heard of someone being killed by this. You know, killing themselves this way is yeah. this really a good idea? So I and I just got to add, you know, so when when I discovered this, you know, I took this to the um, presidential bioethics commission. They weren't interested. Uh, I took it to the National Academy of Sciences. They weren't interested. As a matter of fact, the EPA later hired the National Academy of Sciences to say, oh, there's nothing wrong with these experiments. I mean, this, the, the corruption throughout the system, and we see it in climate, but it's also in every other part of the system. I will just point out, um, you know, just yesterday, the you know, chemical industry, which is very shy of, do, of you know, opposing EPA, much less suing them, sued EPA. Be accusing EPA and the National Academy of Sciences of rigging uh, the review of EPA's toxicity assessment for formaldehyde. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm and, and of course, there's another lawsuit of Stan Young, who is a friend of the Heartland Institute. He is suing EPA because EPA has rigged the peer review of particulate matter. So, you know, there's some ongoing action. We'll see what courts say. You know, one of the problems, though, is that it's very difficult for judges to understand any of this. Um, I mean, there's a reason they went into the law. They don't really understand anything mathematical or having to do with science. It's really unfortunate. That's the biggest problem we have with climate science and the media. You know, math is hard. Science is hard. And they don't want to look at that. They only want to go with whatever the story or the rhetoric or the narrative is. They just can't seem to get themselves to look beyond, you know, that that narrative. And that's what we do every week here at the Heartland Institute. We look beyond the narrative. We look for the data. We present the data. We present the real science behind it. You know, and oftentimes it gets ignored because the media, well, it's too hard. You know, they don't want to look at it. They sound, well, you know, you make them sound like those uh, dolls that people complained about a few years ago, the children's dolls where where they'd have the girl doll say, math is hard. And they say, oh, that's sexist. You can't say that. And yet that's what our judges do all the time. Yeah. You know, oh, math is hard. Who are they, Barbie? Uh and that's not a plug for the movie, by the way. Yeah, don't yeah. do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you know, and you can tell them pretty much anything. And I think one of our commenters said earlier, I think it was Andy May, actually, who said this earlier, you, you choose a crusade and then you just do study after study after study after study to try and get something to prove it. And if you don't, then you kind of fudge it a little bit and continue from there. Um, yeah. I think that's, a, that's a lot of what we see in the climate sciences in general. Yeah. Well, I, I've got to say, you know, I, I've worked on EPA issues since November, 1990. And I, you know, I can't think of a single controversy that I've worked on that has been true or has had an element of truth to it. Um, it's, it's, you know, our environment is largely clean. Uh, there are, there are times when the environment is not so clean and needs to be cleaned up. There are accidents, uh, but generally speaking, our air and water are clean, especially considering how many people we have. Um, yet you would think that we are living in the most perilous times ever. And it's, it's just not true, but it, you know, when you have all these 20-somethings working in the media, 
they're, they're not interested in knowing anything. You know, I, 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 I didn't start working on environmental issues because I was in, in, interested in the environment. I just, it's just what I wound up doing. And so I have spent, you know, all this time working on a lot of different environmental issues. Um, but yet there are all these people that accuse me of not caring about the environment, but they, you know, fancying themselves that, you know, they care so much, but they haven't put, you know, any effort into learning anything about the environment. Right. And, and I want to point out, I care, but I don't want to know anything. Yeah. I want to point out something about today uh, and, and its proximity to history. You know, yesterday was, the, I believe, the 54th anniversary of the moon landing. And that was a monumental day for the world and, and technology and science and humanity. But on the same day, there was a headline that happened that was very much about environmentalism. And it sort of was the kickoff for the whole EPA thing in 1969. Um, Lake Erie caught fire. Mm. Remember that? Yeah. Lake Erie caught fire because of all the pollutants in that river that feeds Lake Erie. And it, it, it was a minor headline that made news along with the moon landing uh, during that time. But it really kind of was sort of, a, it got promoted quite a bit after that. And it was sort of the impetus for, you know, starting the EPA. And if I, if I remember correctly, the EPA, the EPA was formed by, um, there it is, the Cuyahoga River sparked the environmental movement. Right. Yeah, it's the, the first Earth Day, the EPA. No one talks about the fact that the Cuyahoga had caught fire five times in, in previous decades uh, <laughs> and, that, and that the pollution that went into the Cuyahoga was all sanctioned uh, by governments uh, after they stopped people defending their property rights yeah. to clean water uh, under common law when, when the business of America was business in the, in the early part of the century. So we're just going to override everyone's rights and let let corporations pollute. So they create the problem, and then seventy years later, uh, they create a bigger problem with the government. Yeah. So you know, this is a great example. I mean, we have cleaned up all these problems. Rivers do not catch on fire anymore. Really? Uh, yeah. And and, and and you know, I, I will say one thing. I mean, I, I mentioned earlier there are real environmental problems, and so you know, the rivers don't catch on on fire anymore. They are a lot cleaner than they were, but you know, they're not as clean as, you know, they used to be before, you know, people settled around these things. And I mean, one of the issues, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to be accused of denying all environmental issues. One issue is stormwater management. We do a really lousy job of that. Uh, you know, we just channel all this, you know, water from, from uh, gutters during rainstorms and it just goes straight into these rivers and, you know, has effects. And, uh, you know, I think instead of wasting money on windmills and, uh, solar panels and and the rest of the junk we you know chasing trace levels of chemicals in the environment you know we should fix the stormwater you know we should we should try to figure out what we could do about agricultural runoff I mean some of these are real issues but we're chasing the fake issues yeah I yeah. think the biggest problem with the EPA is that you know they've solved the bigger problems I mean when yeah. the EPA was formed it did good actual work it solved mm -hmm. a lot of these you know these crises associated with pollution, whether it be air pollution or water pollution or river pollution or whatever. And as you point out, yeah, rivers don't catch fire anymore. And the air in Los Angeles is far cleaner than it used to be, you know? Oh I, man, Anthony. I, I think I, our former president would dispute you on that, Anthony. So would Jay Lair. Uh, well, they, look, there were state agencies that were cleaning up the rivers before the feds ever got involved. Not oh, every yeah. state had its own agency. Well, right. But the, in the states that had them, the rate of uh, pollution reduction was going faster under the states than when the federal government got involved and set the threshold. Well, that's a good point. Yeah. And But my point is, is that they're trying to stay relevant today. And so they dig deeper and deeper into more obscure and pointless things to try to stay relevant as an agency because the way that Washington works, you've got to look toward your budget next year. And if you're not using your whole budget this year and not producing something, you know, that fits your narrative or your mission so, statement or whatever, you know, you lose your funding. And that's the whole thing. So I can bring this back to particulate matter. So when EPA started regulating, um, you know, air pollution in the 1970s with the Clean Air Act uh, of 1970, uh, they focused on uh, a, a form of particulate matter, really sort of big particulate matter called uh, suspended particulate, you know, stuff you could see. So they cleaned that up, uh, but that wasn't good enough. And they started focusing on what they call PM10, which is particulate matter about 
uh, 10 millionths of a, a meter in diameter. And then over the years, they cleaned up PM10 and they had nothing to do. So then they started focusing on PM2.5, which is, you know, particulate matter, two and a half millionths of a meter wide. Um, and so, you know, now particulate matter, you know, has met all their standards. Uh, they're trying to do two things. They're trying to drive the standard down to zero, which is impossible, which will keep them in business forever. Uh, on the other hand, they also have something called uh, UFP ultrafine particulate matter, which is particulate matter smaller than a millionth of a meter in, in width. So, you know, they, it, it's this uh, permanent employ PM is like a permanent employment act for the EPA air staff. It's uh, it's geez, if that trend constant, continues, they're gonna go after quarks and neutrinos. It's <laughs> constant, yeah, it's constant mission creep. I'd like to say the EPA was the only agency. Um the EPA may be the Paul Ehrlich of agencies. They'd never been right once, as far as I can tell. But you know, that's what Steve said. Since 1990, he hasn't found one scare that they've been right about. Uh, but it's 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 mission creep. I can't think of a federal agency. Show me the federal agency that has been created that has ever solved the problem, the specific problem or set of problems that they were meant to solve, as opposed to growing over time, taking on new missions, despite not having solved the, the initial problem. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and I, I was going to say about that comment about Los Angeles, I've been watching a TV show from the 1970s recently. And every time they give a skyline view of Los Angeles, it's like the photographs of New York a couple weeks ago. It's like an orange exactly. haze over the entire thing. Yeah, you, you watch any old episode of Chips, any yeah. old episode of Chips and watch Ponch and John ride their motorcycles on the freeway of yeah. Los Angeles and it looks oh, just John. horrible in the background. Uh, and, and yet and that's and yet that's when population growth was going in California. When people were moving to California as opposed to fleeing as fast as they can. And, and, right. and you know, I think these Spanish conquistadors as they sailed by Los Angeles, they noticed the haze in the distance. So this, you know, air quality has always been a problem there way before, uh, a, you know, cheeseburgers or coal plants or gas plants or cars or anything. It's a mountain basin up against yeah. the sea. So salt air in the air creates the, creates haze. The plant life creates the haze. It's also, by the way, a desert. You know, <laughs> we, we it was one of the least populated air regions of the country when the Native Americans were the dominant uh, population because they understood that you don't, build civilizations in a desert. Oh, wait, all we have to do is dam a river thousands of miles away and truck all the water from there across several states to us, and we can make the desert bloom like a rose. And millions of people will flock there. And they did. Yeah. And they did. <laughs> yeah, and it, now they're it, trying to amazing. put it back to, and now now they're they're trying trying to to it back the, to the conditions. Yeah. And now yeah, we can't eat cheese. It was before it was livable. Yeah. 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 So, uh, Steve, what's your take on, you know, where the whole PM 2.5 thing is going? Is there any relief from this madness in sight? Or are they just going to continue to use this as a hammer to get rid of everything in our lives today? Well, yeah. So uh, the Biden administration is in the middle of uh, tightening the PM 2.5 standard once again. Um, you know, unless we get a new administration, there's nothing that's going to stop that except... Uh, Stan Young, who I, who I mentioned before, is a Heartland, Heartland supporter, Heartland uh, expert. Um, he, he sued EPA. And so we, um, we lost the first round in the trial court because the Trump appointed judge thought that the, you know, the law requiring a balanced peer review allowed EPA to do anything it wanted. Um, and, and it doesn't. So we have appealed. We are in the uh, D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, the oral arguments will be in the middle of August. If if Stan Young was to prevail, uh, that would halt EPA's effort to um, tighten the PM 2.5 standard. Um, you know, I, I have to I have to mention like during the Trump administration, the EPA's independent science advisors completely debunked and discredited all the EPA's PM 2.5 science. But then. When Biden took over, Biden fired all those people, including um, Tony Cox, who's also one of the plaintiffs in in, in the lawsuit. Uh, fired fired them all and replaced them with EPA funded grantees that work on PM two point five. Some of these people have received, you know, sixty million dollars worth of uh, grants. 
So mm-hmm. EPA rigged the peer review and that's how they've been able to proceed. So we're, you know, there's a lawsuit going on right now. Uh, we'll see what happens if, if we can stop this illegal peer review, then I think we can stop the whole regulation. So, but it, it you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's an ongoing struggle because EPA is, they, they've got so much invested in PM 2.5, they can never walk away from it. It's like Al Gore with climate. Can Al Gore ever walk away from climate? No matter, I mean, let's say we, we proved him wrong tomorrow. Can he ever walk away with it? No. No. All righty. Well, you know, that's a, I hope that this lawsuit prevails because honestly, the uh, the structure and the future of the American public depends on it. It really does. It really does. All right. So we've got questions. People have been asking questions in our comments, and we want to give you guys a chance to uh, air your questions here. Our producer, Andy, should have some questions stacked up. Let's see the first one. All right. I thought CO2 was the most toxic substance known to mankind. Well. Is that for me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not uh, a pollutant. Andy May asks the question, why test the idea that PM 2.5 is deadly when there is no suggestion that it is? Why not wait until there's some evidence it is bad? EPA is crazy. Yeah. Well, that, that's right. Um, but but EPA, you know, that, this is why they don't call it uh, soot or, you know, by some conventional name. They call it PM 2.5 because it's scary. No one knows what it is. And they can say yeah, that PM like two point five kills hydrogen monoxide. You know, <laughs> right, right, right. The whole thing is a trick. Mm-hmm. All right. Next question. Douglas Pollock asks: Didn't Obama leave the EPA with fifteen hundred new regulations? Is that true? Well, uh, you know, EPA is issuing more and more regulations. The, the only decline in EPA regulations ever was during the Trump administration. And of course, it has just taken off again with uh, Biden. I mean, even during previous Republican administrations, the EPA has been out of control. No Republican has ever gotten a handle on the EPA. Trump yeah. did, but you know, he's gone. A lot of people don't realize this, but the Bush administration was really bad with a lot of this stuff. Oh, yeah. I mean, there was just tons of new regulations coming out during his uh, terms. So, well, well, of course, the EPA was a creation of a Republican administration too. So. Right. Well, so the thing is, is that, you know, EPA was uh, always staffed with, you know, left-wing hippies from the 1970s and they run the place. And it doesn't matter, um, uh, you know, if a Republican took over, you know, we during the Trump administration, we heard about the resistance. Well, it's these left-wing hippies that run the place. And uh, they're a lot smarter than the people that uh, Trump picked to run the EPA, including some of my friends. Um, you know, Republicans are just have just been afraid of um, learning anything about the environment, learning anything about science. And, and it's it, it's really it really hurts their ability to control these people. Um, you know, and, and someone like me, I'm way too controversial <laughs> yeah. to be, you know, at the EPA. But, uh, you know, I, w- I would shut a lot of what they do down. I would reassign these people to Alaska. I mean, this <laughs> is an agency that needs to be shut down. Well, no, you no, know, no. Put them in the Permian Basin. That's where okay. they need you guys. They, well, I've long advocated moving uh, moving the uh, whole of government to Death Valley, Arizona, uh, and see how long they stay in session every year. Right. But um, I mean, literally, it used to be a it used to be a swamp, and before there was air conditioning, they adjourned for large right. sections of time. Precisely for that region. That's why I say let's go back to it. That was a, a terrible yeah. idea to give Congress air conditioning. Right. But um, <laughs> let me uh, say, well, I forget what I was going to say, but it had to do with uh, what you were talking about before. All right. Well, let's go on to our next question then um, that we've got. Uh, when, when I was at, this is from Tom White. He says, when I was at Penn State in the early 70s as an environmental research management graduate of 74, the greenhouse effect was good. When and how did CO2 and the associated greenhouse effect become evil? Well, I can speak to that. Um, it's really started with the Mariner probes going to Venus and they discovered that Venus had this fantastically dense carbon dioxide atmosphere and the temperature on the surface could melt lead. And so from that, 
people started worrying about, well, what happens if we increase the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of Earth? Is it going to get hot enough to melt lead? Or are we going to see, you know, all this stuff? And, and people like Carl Sagan ran wild with theories associated with a runaway greenhouse effect on Earth. And that's really when it started happening. Steve, you've got some history on this. Is that about right? I think that sounds right, but I remember um, reading Paul Ehrlich wrote about the greenhouse effect in the population bomb. He was worried about it back then. And, and of course, um, you know, people have been worried about it. Well, some people have been worried about emissions forever. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm going to go with your history. Uh, I guess that that's when it really picked up. To Tom's, yeah. to, to Tom's point, though, he's right that the greenhouse effect used to be considered good by most scientists. The guy who created, you know, who came up with the term, um, Sven Arrhenius, uh, um, back in the, uh, I think, 19th century, who first talked about how um, CO2 was a greenhouse gas, he praised the rise, he praised, he, he, he longed for a rise in, in carbon dioxide because he says it's good for plants and that will help us feed the world. You know, and, I, it, and everyone saying, calls him the godfather, the great god grandfather of, of, global warming but he was he was in favor he thought a little warming was a good thing and he of course he was right yeah well anthony maybe you can help me out with this i you know the actual greenhouses don't don't work through they're not warmed by carbon dioxide right no I mean, they don't they're warmed by conduction or not 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 that's by exactly the, right and it, the whole, so the whole thing is a misnomer right yeah it, you're exactly right about that it, it has to do with the fact that it has glass a greenhouse has glass, and without the glass, it wouldn't work. The glass is a one-way switch for light. It lets invisible light, but it doesn't let certain wavelengths of light back out, such as the infrareds and so forth. And so what happens is, is it causes the interior of the greenhouse to heat due to that blocking of light going back out. And so it's... Uh, the analogy associated with the atmospheric greenhouse effect is that carbon dioxide is blocking a little bit of light going out to space to cool the planet. Well, that's not absolutely true at all. What's happening is carbon dioxide does, in fact, slow the progress somewhat of light coming from the surface, infrared at night particularly, going up into the atmosphere. It bounces around a little bit off of CO2 molecules. And so it's slower going up to space to, you know, that heat from the earth. And in fact, if you go and look at temperature records, no matter where you're at on the planet, uh, and you compare that to carbon dioxide emissions, what's really happened is the, the warming effect of carbon dioxide, even though it's fairly small, has been felt in the nighttime environments. But then it's completely overwhelmed by other factors, such as the urban heat island effect and the factors that I've discovered associated with station siting, where you got a piece of concrete right next to a, to a thermometer. Those have far greater effects than the minuscule amount of carbon dioxide, uh, you know, uh, muting the, the light going back up to the surface. But, but the even other important point is that greenhouse operators pump their greenhouses full of carbon dioxide to help plants grow. And right. so, you know, they don't roast their plants when they do that. So there's really no problem. <laughs> no, no, they don't. If you, run a greenhouse, from... if you run a greenhouse in the winter, you have to heat it. I was going to say, they still artificially heat their greenhouses. Right. So the greenhouse effect, even under high carbon dioxide conditions, work. isn't sufficient. Exactly. Exactly. But, you know. I made the joke about. I made the joke about the firmament in a previous episode, I think, how it seems like the climate alarmists take the atmosphere to be like a firmament, like an actual greenhouse where it's impermeable to energy going back out to space to an extent. And uh, that just reminded me of that. It's funny. Well, that's because science is hard. We don't understand it. <laughs> All right. Douglas Pollock asks, Anthony, is it true? that to scare people, the heat wave hysteria shows ground temperatures instead of much lower air temperatures at two meters. Yes, indeedy. Some media outlets have started showing pictures of the surface temperature of the physical ground, the skin temperature, uh, as measured by satellites and other instruments, instead of the air temperature. Because, gosh, that looks even scarier than a temperature of 98 degrees, right? 
Well, any idiot who's ever been to a, even if you're not an idiot, <laughs> if you've been to a Kmart parking lot in the middle of summer, you know that thing is damned hot compared to the air. Your pet will tell you that if you try to get your pet to walk from the car to go inside or whatever. They don't want to walk on that asphalt or the hot ground. Yes, indeed, the ground is hotter. That's what warms the air, you boneheads. Anyway. No, look, you talked about your dog or your pet leaving the car. Check the surface temperature of your car, right? Oh, right. It, uh, I, you know, you see those pictures of people cooking eggs on their car. Yeah, that's a lot hotter than the air around it. <laughs> so, Anthony, right. how are we going to overcome all this ridiculous um, media? I mean, this is so it's so ridiculous. It's over the top, way over the top. I'm thinking right now maybe the thing to do is to send every media bonehead a set of infrared glasses that they can wear outside so that they can understand yes the surface of the earth is hot but look wait look up into the air oh gosh that's not so hot and yeah. in I, fact I, if you take if you take an infrared you, you can get these now on amazon and I've, I've got one and i've used it to photograph weather station locations you get one of these little infrared cameras that you can plug into your cell phone right it's they're cheap you can get them for under 100 bucks now used to be these things cost thousands of dollars anyway Plug one of these into your camera and your cell phone on the USB port and take pictures around your area. The sky appears almost black while the, the surface of the asphalt or the ground or whatever is glowing reds and oranges and yellows. And, and that gives you right there the difference of what's going on. That's what it's going to take to educate the media. But again, science is hard. They don't want to look at that. No, but the sad thing is, you know, just like Steve mentioned earlier, though, I, I think he admits he didn't believe. Um, it's the media doesn't care about facts. <laughs> it's not about evidence. There's nothing that will convince them. You can't educate people who it's not a lack of education that's stopping them from telling the truth. They simply have a narrative that they believe and they're pushing for whatever reasons you want to say they're pushing it, paper sales, ad revenue, I don't know. And so you can you could give every you could give every science reporter one of those infrareds. I think it wouldn't change their reporting one bit because it's not about the truth. They can always yeah. go back and get a quote from Michael Mann. <laughs> and, and probably that's what they do. Oh well, these these infrared things. Don't show you the truth. What are you gonna? What are you gonna believe? Your lying right. eyes through infrared, or what I'm telling you? Or my tree rings? Yeah, or my tree yeah. rings. Exactly. The infrared conspiracy yeah. theory. Okay. All Final question. For Michael Mann should go to uh, Steve Malloy, <laughs> not the Harvard <laughs> Institute. By the way. I have a question on behalf of Great Donald K. Right? <laughs> How dare you? Well. How dare you? <laughs> All right. I think that pretty well wraps it up on that note. Thanks to the climate munchkin of Greta. Uh, you know, Steve, I want to thank you for coming on and talking about 2.5 and all of the it. terrible things that the EPA is doing. You know, I'm really going to believe that there's a crisis when the EPA starts regulating halitosis. I'll tell you, that's just something they really need to get into. Sterling and Linnea, thanks for being with us today. I appreciate your, your insight and commentary. And I want to remind everyone to go visit climaterealism.com and also to visit our website, climateataglance.com, where we have instant answers to a lot of this insanity out there. And the new website that Linnea is running, energyinaglance.com. And let's not forget Steve's website, who's older than any of these, junkscience.com, which has re uh, debunking on a regular basis as well. So for all of you folks, Steve Sterling and Linnea, I want to say thank you again. I'm Anthony Watts, Senior Fellow for Environment and Climate for the Heartland Institute, wishing you a great day and a great weekend. Bye-bye. How dare you?